It was. It was a year ago to this Sunday, for those of you that worshipped with us in the garden. It was after I taught on the widow's might. Yeah, <laughs> Bill's laughing. He knows. I said I would never do this again. I did. I never was going to do this again. And God is so great about... Uh, Mark Choate, where are you? What did he say? When God says, we say never, God... What did you say? That's what he listens for. Never? Yeah. Sister, you ain't seen nothing yet. Oh, I need this thing. Hang on one second. Well, good morning. I am moderately excited to be here with you today in this capacity. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here with you today. Um, and we hope, I know that you join in with me in hoping that our brother Joe has a wonderful time away. There is nobody other than Mike Bassett who needs a break more, who needs some rest more. You're, okay, that's fine. I might too. Uh, today, we, today we continue in a series called Jesus in Genesis. We're in week nine. We started at the very beginning of the year looking at where pictures of Jesus show up in the Old Testament. And today our lesson continues with the family that Joe talked to us about last week. Only there's no Sarah, but we're sticking with Abraham and Isaac. It's a continuation of that. And we're going to jump right into our passage, and I'm going to encourage you to settle in and settle down, because this is a long one. He gave me 18 verses to read. <laughs> That's because he can't read that many. <laughs> he, doesn't have the he doesn't have the patience. When he's not here, I'm going to get the digs in, trust me. But he knows I love him more than anything in the world. So, all right, Genesis 22, verses 1 through 18. After these things, God tested Abraham. I'm going to read from up here. God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He, God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come back again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took it in his hand, the fire and the knife. And so they went, both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood. Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And so they went, both of them together. And when they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham was like, oh, thank God. And he said, here I am. He said, the angel said, don't lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Always thanks be to God for God's word. You know, Grace Life, we look at a passage three ways, and Joe makes sterile and I do this. So before, I've done this probably a dozen times, and Joe's like, do the historical, theological, and devotional, I'm like, no. 
But today, <laughs> don't tell me what to do. Um, today, I'm going to. So the historical section is where we talk about what about man, what is he doing, what did he do, why did he do it. The theology is what about God, and then devotional application is what about us. But since we're in a, in a series called Jesus in Genesis, I want us to stop right at the very beginning and look for pictures of Jesus. Because throughout history, and they're all over the place, throughout history, um, Christians have identified or related this story more than any other story in the Hebrew text to the story of Jesus, to the Easter story. And you don't have to too, dig too deeply to understand why. We have a father who has an only son who is condemned to die. Right? The condemned son, obedient to his father, obedient even until death, has to carry the own, his own wood up to the top of a mountain where he's going to be sacrificed. After spending three days believing that Isaac was as good as dead, Abraham, on that third day, Isaac is still alive. And after spending three days in the tomb, Jesus, who was dead, is now alive. And those are just a couple of the examples. They're all over the place. If you want to read more, there's the thing called Google. Go ahead and JFGI. <laughs> just and Google it. But it wasn't until the only sacrifice that counted, Jesus dying on the cross, the lamb that God would provide for the offering. We saw that in our passage for today. It wasn't until Jesus dying on the cross that God's promise to Abraham could ultimately be fulfilled and he would multiply his offspring, that promise. And make sure you come back next week because when Brother Joe gets back, he's going to talk to us about that promise. But for this morning... We're going to look at something a little bit different because this is, this is a difficult passage. Joe always gives me the hard ones. The widow's might. Somebody killing his son. Come on. <laughs> Thanks. But let's start with the, the history. What about God? I don't have a whole big PowerPoint. I just do the scripture. It's too much. I can't. I can play and sing, but I can't click and talk. And that's way too much for me. <laughs> that. That's way too much. Um, but what about man? What about God? What is he doing? Just as a quick recap from last week, Abraham and Sarah, who were both super, super, super old, and they were unable to have children. They were not, Sarah was not able to bear children. And as Joe has taught us a few weeks in a row, the people back then were trying to get busy making some mad babies. So we assume that Abraham and Sarah tried, but they weren't unable. But then through God's provision, they are given the gift of a son. And on this son, the promises of God to Abraham are supposed to be fulfilled. But then a few years later, God comes to Abraham and he says, I want you to go kill your son. And Abraham says, okay. Right? Isn't that what we saw? Thus ending, let's move on to the theology. Kidding. Kidding. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy you're here. No, we can't move on to the theology yet. We can't. We're going to spend a lot of time in, in the historical section today. What about man? What about... He did, why did he, what did he do, why did he do it? I think for a passage like this, we have to spend time trying to understand how somebody, when told or when asked to do um, something like this, can respond with such immediate obedience, without any questions, without any pushback, without any dialogue at all. We've got to understand, I think, the history here. So we're going to spend the bulk of our time this morning in the historical section. And so as we read and as we study and we try to figure out what's going on here, we go back some chapters in Genesis and we see the story of Abraham and God. And as we read, we learn a lot about their relationship. They talked a lot. They spent a lot of time together. And we, we are told in both the Old and the New Testaments, the book of Isaiah and the book of James, that they were friends. Abraham was the friend of God. And I love the passage in Isaiah because it's where God says, Abraham, he's my friend. Like, that's legit to have God call you his friend. That's a big deal. And to Abraham, yes, God was his friend, but Abraham also recognized and worshiped God as being the one true eternal God. Abraham knew who God was. And like the greatest, though, of friendships, and we see this friendship evolve, the greatest of friendships, when we see a behavior in our friend that causes us some concern, those great relationships allow us to go to our friend 
and allow us to start asking them some questions like, what are you doing? What is happening here? Why are you doing this? Are you sure you want to do this? And that's what Abraham does to God. That's what he does to God. That's how confident Abraham is in his friendship with God, that he knows he can question God. I would never, ever have the guts. I'm, I, mm -mm. I don't have the guts to do stuff like that. I'm very respectful of authority. But Abraham does, and we see it in chapter 18. Abraham pushes back on God, and he questions him after God says that he's going to destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's a lot of passage, but I'm just going to show you one piece. Abraham, or Genesis 18, 23 to 25. It was too weird to look up like that. Let me look this way. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of 50 righteous, the 50 right, righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do what's right? He argued with God on the basis of God's character. And it wasn't just 50. They went from 50 to 45 to 40 to 30 to 20 until at 10, God finally said, I'll spare the city. And while we know he didn't, that's not the point of the story. Apparently there weren't even 10 righteous people in the city. Abraham was so confident that he could go to God and he could question him when he thought something was right. So that's what makes it hard in my mind to believe that he didn't do that in this example. In our story today, this was his son. The son who he had waited for forever. The son of all of the promise. But we don't see questions. We don't see pushback today. What we see is a man who is asked to fulfill the most horrific of requests get to work. He got to work the next day. He didn't wait a week. He didn't wait a month. He didn't wait 10 years trying to figure it out. He didn't. He got to work. He rose early the next day and responded to what God asked him to do. It's interesting in our story for today, we don't get a lot of narrative. We don't get a lot of background. There's not a lot of psychology. It's hard to maybe figure this out, but I think if we wanted to ask Abraham if we were there in that moment with him and we said, hey, why on earth did you say yes to this? That's your son. Abraham would say something like this. I've walked and talked with God for many years and not only do I know that he is the one true eternal God, he's also my friend. And while I don't understand why I am being asked to do this Thing, because my friend has always been faithful to me in the things that he has promised and what he has already shown me, like giving Sarah and I the gift of our son, Isaac. I don't know if you heard, but Sarah busted out laughing because it was impossible. But that's what God did. He gave us already so much that I have to believe and trust that my faithful, eternal God friend is going to make this work out now. This is going to work out. And we know he thought that. Verse 5 of our passage tells us that they are going to go and worship together, and they're coming back. Did you catch that when we read that passage? That we, they're coming back. Abraham had so much confidence in God that in his mind, there was no way Isaac wasn't coming back down that mountain with him. That was not going to happen. See, we try to figure things out in the passage, but Daryl and I were talking on Friday, and he said, you know, sometimes we try to like psycho psychoanalyze and try to figure out what's happening here. We don't ever need to go outside of God's word to understand why Abraham knew it was going to be okay. We see it in the book of Hebrews. It's chapter 11, verses 17 through 19. By faith, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, which, figuratively speaking, he, he did receive him back. See, what's most incredible to me, and I've really appreciated having to study for this, is understanding and getting to watch as I've read through the story of Abraham and God, how God has continued to evolve Abraham's faith, how his faith has matured and grown as God has continued to reveal more and more of himself. You see, when you go back to the beginning, pre-God, Abraham rightfully had no business whatsoever believing in God at all to begin with. 
He had no business believing in God. And now we see a man who was so matured in his faith, he's so matured in his faith that he now believes, check this out, he believes in the power of resurrection. Theologically, Abraham is light years ahead of his time. He figured it out before anybody else was able to figure out that God could resurrect the dead. He had proof. He saw it already. Sarah, she was barren. Genesis chapter 11 tells us she was barren. Her womb was dead. And out of death, God brought life. Death, God brings life out of death all the time. He saw it with Abraham when Abraham, or he saw it with Isaac when Isaac was born. And now he believes nothing is impossible. God is the bringer of life out of death. And that un unbelievably confident, unwavering faith is what allows Abraham in this moment to respond to God. Speaking of God, let's move on to the theological. See, for us as readers of this story, we have an insight. We got the answers ahead of time that Abraham didn't get. Remember in the beginning when we were told that God tested Abraham? We knew ahead of time. Abraham didn't know, but we did. And here's a news flash for you. In case if you have not yet experienced this in your own life, God does indeed test us. Amen? Amen. 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 But the test is never for our benefit. It's or for, excuse me. <laughs> Let's strike one. The test is never for God's benefit so he can figure out what we'll do or who we are or how we're going to respond. He knows us. He created us. And not only, if you don't think God knows you, he does. He knows you physically. Matthew and Luke tell us, Jesus says that every single hair on our head is numbered. For me, that's, a good, that's good news because I got a lot of hair. <laughs> for those of you who don't, sorry about your luck. Don't worry, God still knows you. So you're not, if you don't have a lot of hair, you've not, obviously not been chosen. <laughs> sit here and twirl my pretty hair. Where was I in my story? Oh, he does know us. He knows everything about us. He knows, well, let me show you this. Psalm 139. This is some excerpts. This is my favorite psalm. Oh Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Scary. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. Scarier. For you, inform, you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed stub substance, and your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. How awesome, how scary, right? It scares me. I know me. I know what I am capable of. Oh, yeah. But then it's reassuring because God knows me too. And I don't have to be afraid that he's not going to love me because he already knows what I'm going to do. And that's just an excerpt of that passage. Your homework tonight is to go home and read the whole thing. Write this down. Psalms 139. Look at some of you writing. Nobody's writing. Jeez. <laughs> but because of how intimately God knows us, when he tests us, it's never for his benefit. It is solely for ours. So we can see the areas where we are strong, like Abraham, and we can see the areas where we are weak. And we learned about weak links last week, didn't we? Pastor Joe taught us that weakness is where grace gets its best bang for the buck. Let's move on to the devotional. First, and I've already spilled these beans to you in case if you haven't figured it out, if you have been given the gift of faith, you have to understand that at some point God is going to test your faith. He's going to test you and 
get really excited about this part, he's not gonna send you a Google invite for the test. <laughs> not, I know. We could ask Joe to do it, he can't get Google invites right. We could ask Joe to do it. He doesn't let us know. Abraham didn't know, why should we know? And second, there are times when you are going to pass the test and there are times when you're gonna fail. There are times when we all fail because even though I don't like this, failure is my least favorite word. I do not like to fail. I'm not a failure. But then I realized that we are all weak somehow. And when we pass this test, right, if we have a pass and a fail, when we pass, I'm not quite sure that we realize it was a test. God can't give us that ahead of time. But when the test comes and when we pass, we know we pass because we're able to just sail right through it the same way that Abraham did. We navigate. There is no question whatsoever as to how we're going to respond. We just go. God has got this. Like Jen said the kids, I've got this. I've got you. Trust me. And you're like, I got it. I am on board. And you go. And then your life becomes this grace life that we live together through the grace life. It becomes a living testimony to the rest of us. And for the times when you fail, which again, you will, don't be mad, but we all fail at some point. I think sometimes we know right away because it pierces our heart, right? Has your heart ever been pierced when you knew right away? Oh, it's brutal. But I think what's even worse is what I've experienced from my own personal life. I fail, here comes the test. Guess what happens? I fail, here comes the test. Guess what happens? I fail again, test again, fail again. And then I get angry and I get really frustrated because the test keeps coming and it takes different shapes and it takes different forms, but yet that test is still there. For example, three years ago in my life, I experienced about nine or 10 months of sheer brutality for me. For other people, it might not have been that bad. When my mother's health really started to decline. Some of you know that I live at home with my mom and I, I, I am her caretaker. And that's when she kind of really turned the corner. So starting to deal with that and understanding kind of what was gonna happen with her. And then I had pre, pre Valley Mooney. Valley's my current dog. I had two other dogs, Cameo and Gunner. They were brother and sister German Shepherd. And I loved those dogs more than I have ever loved anything in my life. They're in my heart. Cammy was my heart of my heart. This is her necklace. They got cancer. And that stunk. And then right after Cammy was initially diagnosed, literally my house started falling apart. Coop, you'll love this one. My house, the roof, which we knew was bad. I kind of had let it go. I did. Um, but then we had a tropical storm come through. And because I work from home, I was on my couch. And I was sitting and I looked into the kitchen because I heard like a drip, 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 drip. And sure enough, here there's water pouring in from the ceiling fan. And I'm like, oh, Lord. So then we have to pay to get the roof replaced. And that's really cheap. <laughs> Two days after that, I kid you not, almost said something different, kid you not, I go into my garage because I hear a drip again. I like walk out there and I'm like, what is splish splashing on my feet? And I see water dripping from the attic hatch. So the plumber comes. We had pinhole leaks through the plumbing of our entire house. Then we had to have the entire house replumbed, right? I'm not kidding. I was hemorrhaging money at this point. I pulled money out of my 401k. Don't tell Joe. Oh, gosh, she's listening. He'll kill me. <laughs> right after the plumbing, I'm not kidding, the plumbing is replaced. I am in the kitchen and I'm doing my dishes. And I'm like, something smells funky. Somebody said it. Who said it? Mold. Looked up on the kitchen cabinet. The mold remediation guys come, and not only was it just some mold, it was black, it was black mold, yes, half the house. Black mold is like the, literally the worst. 
And so we had to have our mold reme our house do the mold remediation thing. If you know what that is, they strip your house to the studs. They scrape the wood, they treat it, they do all this stuff. And because of where my mom was at in her health at the time, she did not want to leave the house. So they cornered off. Uh, we have a not a, it's not a big house, it's not a small house, um, but they cornered off a section of our house to live in for two months. So it was me and my mother, because moms and daughters always get along so well, don't we? <laughs> Pam, you know, woo! <laughs> two German shepherds, a cat, and the bird that my sister left at my house and won't take back because he's because he's really mean and I'm the only person that he likes. Four months after that, I got laid off from my job. A job where I have never done anything except for grow and achieve and succeed. I'm really, I was really good at my job. I don't think that all of those things were the test. Let me be clear. None of those things I don't think were the test. But the test comes as a result of all of those bad things happening. I now have... Um, I'd always had a tendency to con be a controller. It is like on steroids now. Because if I don't make sure everything is okay, if I don't think two steps ahead, if I don't think faster, be smarter, try to plan for what may or may not happen to me, to mom, to Valley, something bad is gonna happen again. I don't have it in me to do it again. It was brutal. I don't have it. And so now I'm the master puppeteer. I'm a director here, I'm a director at home, I'm a director everywhere, because I can't run the risk that something bad is gonna happen to me again. But you know what happens, how, what happens in life? No matter how hard I try to squeeze, and like a vice, man, I'm really good at this. Do bad things still happen? No matter how hard we try to control them? We're darn right they do. And I hear God telling me during those moments, who's in control? Is it you or is it me? Who's in control? You or me. I'm going to control it. Who's in control? You or me. Really, how's it working out for you? Who's in control? You or me. I am. No, you're not. No, you are not. You are not in control. I am in control. Why is your faith so weak? Over the last six months, that has punched me in the stomach on many, many, many occasions. I am keenly aware. But still in the midst of all of the muck and the test as it comes, God is still faithful. What he's allowing me to see recently, not to worry about, oh my God, what happened? Look, but look what happened before. Look what happened before to me. God's saying, yeah, it did happen to you, but look how I provided for you. Look how I've taken care of you. Look how I gave you a job within a month. Right? Look how your, my dogs died. I have Valley. She's their niece. I love that dog. My mom, her health is not better. It's never going to get better. But now we have created ways for me to be better able to take care of her so I don't have to be such a total fruitcake maniac. I don't want anything, she's my mommy. I don't want anything to happen to her. But God now has shown me, here's how I've provided for you. God proves to me all the time that he can bring life out of death. Because my spirit was dying. And if you're anything like me, and if you've experienced something even remotely close to similar, you'll know that in those moments... We have some choices, right? We can continue to let those same patterns go on and on and on that leave us frustrated and that they leave us angry. No matter what we try to do, no matter what we do, we are frustrated and we are angry because we're living a shallow faith. That's what that is. That's what I have. I ain't too proud to tell you my faith was very shallow. Or, or we have another choice. Our other choice is that we can stop we can open our eyes, we can open our hearts to what God is trying to teach us. He wants to show us the weakness that in some way our faith is lacking because it's not until the depths, the depths of that test come that the depths of just how great God's graces are made apparent to us, right? 
And that's when our faith is able to grow because in those moments when we are able to humbly recognize how weak and how broken we are and how ma- no matter how hard we try, we can't do it, but God can do it. God tells me all the time, I am your provider. I am your rock. I am your shield. I am your defender. I am your hope and I am your salvation. And when that weakness comes and we realize exactly who we are and who God is, Megan and God aren't here. God's not here. It's vast. It's an eternity between me and God. When I recognize, when we recognize, if you're in a situation like that too, when we recognize where we are, there's no question about how we're going to respond. So we have a teachable heart that's ready to learn and to grow. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's close with one verse. I wish Tori was here. James is her jam. Right? Jazz is clapping. Count it all joy. Don't get angry. Don't get frustrated. My brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. Count it all joy. When you face your trial, you're going to have a choice. You can count it as joy or you can get angry and you can get bitter and you can get frustrated. Is it joy to produce steadfastness or is it going to make you angry and bitter and resentful? It's our choice. I invite you to pray with me. God, we thank you for today and we thank you. I guess we do thank you for trials and tests, even though they're not pleasant. Even though none of us ever, ever like to see that we are weak. It is only when we realize just how weak we are that we can see how strong you are. God, I pray for all of us today, whether we're going through a trial or a test now or the next time that we do, that we have the humility and we have this soft and pliable heart to reach out to you, to seek you, to ask you to help us grow our faith that you show us just how good you are. God, we thank you for the gift of faith. We thank you that you are far more committed to growing our faith than we are. And I pray, Lord, as a congregation, we continue striving towards you we press through, that we lean on you in all things that we do when we're not here and when we are together. In the name of your son, amen. Amen. Ta-da, here's the band.